My name is Christine McKinnon. I'm responsible for the Municipal Affairs and Provincial Planning Division of the Prince Edward Island Department of Communities, Land and Environment. This presentation was first delivered to the PEI Federation of Agriculture on January 29, 2016. The presentation provides a brief overview of the municipal governance system on PEI and touches on some of the issues and challenges and the importance of strengthening local capacity. The Department of Communities, Land and Environment was formed in May 2015, and Minister Robert Mitchell's mandate letter spells out clear priorities for the Department. We are working to develop a new Water Act, adopt a provincial land use policy under the Planning Act, and continue to implement the Carver Report on the Lands Protection Act. We're responsible for preparing for climate change and moving to more green energy sources. We are working on developing a new Municipal Government Act and a funding arrangement for municipalities. My focus in this presentation is on municipal governance. Municipalities are created by provincial legislation, which sets out the standards and operating rules for municipalities. Today, there are 73 municipalities on PEI, but they only cover 30% of the province. About 70% of islanders live in a municipality. Municipalities cover the main urban areas, but also include rural communities and rural areas. About 28% of agricultural land is located within municipal boundaries. Municipalities are created to provide local services for residents. Many of our present-day municipalities started as community improvement committees when local volunteers came together because of an interest in raising money for a community hall or to collect fire dues. Over time, community improvement committees became incorporated as municipal governments so they could have taxation powers rather than fundraising. Municipal legislation recognizes three types of municipalities, cities, towns, and communities, and each has distinct powers and responsibilities. In the same way that standards for water quality and waste disposal have increased over the past 20 years, there are increasing expectations of municipalities. These include financial accountability and auditing, transparency and public access, and increased services. Many island municipalities have very few residents. 63% have a population less than 500 people, and many municipalities have no office hours, no staff, and offer no services other than purchasing fire service. Some municipalities have refused federal infrastructure funding because they're not able to meet the program requirements. Work to review the Municipalities Act and to develop new legislation started 10 years ago. In the new Municipal Government Act, there will be increased standards and requirements for municipalities to ensure that public interests are protected and quality local services are delivered to residents. Today, we have a patchwork of services being delivered. 26 municipalities operate their own fire service, while others contract with private companies. There are 12 sewer utilities and 13 water and sewer utilities. 32 municipalities are responsible for land use planning and development control. Eight municipalities provide services related to their streets and roads. Three municipalities have their own police force and others contract with the RCMP for services. Only 20% of all municipalities have full-time staff and the smallest 28 municipalities provide very limited services. These are examples of different services and costs in PEI municipalities. In the past, waste management was provided at the local level. This changed with the introduction of Waste Watch and the Island Waste Management Corporation. There is now a flat rate for year-round customers, so everyone pays the same cost for the same level of service everywhere in the province. Sewer and water services are utilities and are funded by user fees. If your property is outside of the sewer and water system, you do not pay for these services. And these services are not part of the municipal tax rate. For utilities providing water and wastewater services, there is a range in user fees depending on the number of customers, the distances, and treatment options. 
all municipalities must ensure their residents have fire protection. This service is included in the municipal tax rate if you live in a municipality. People who live outside of municipalities pay fire dues, and these dues, when they're charged, are identified on property taxation bills. The cost of fire protection varies, depending on where you live and the level of service provided. Detailed information about property taxation is provided at the website www.taxandland.pe.ca. The Municipal Affairs website also goes over some of the most frequently asked questions about municipal restructuring and property tax. This slide provides a simple overview of property taxation on PEI. The provincial property tax rate for both commercial and non-commercial property is $1.50 per $100 of assessed value. Residents of PEI are eligible for a provincial tax credit on non-commercial property equal to 50 cents for each $100 of assessed value. This credit is applied to the provincial property tax charges. If land is owned or leased by a bona fide farmer, it may be eligible for a farm assessment credit or a farm use assessment credit. If you live in a municipality, the municipal tax rate per $100 of assessed value is set by the municipal council in their annual budget. The rates vary across the province depending on factors such as municipal services provided and the total assessed value of all property within the municipality. Farmers and property owners who rent or lease to bona fide farmers may be eligible for both provincial and municipal property tax credits. Some municipalities offer rebates for farmers, but this is entirely separate from the property tax rates. I'm not an expert on property taxation, and I encourage you to look at your own tax bills and the website taxandland.pe.ca for more information. This is a very basic example of property tax calculations for a property in a municipality compared to the same property located outside a municipality. In this simple example, the assessed value of the property is $400,000, and this is land only, with no buildings on the property. The provincial tax rate of $1.50 per $100 is applied to the assessed value of $400,000 for a charge of $6,000. Applying the provincial tax credit of 50 cents per hundred reduces this amount by $2,000. In this case, the farm assessment credit is $378,000, which reduces the provincial property taxation charge to $220. The municipal tax rate in this example is 20 cents for each hundred dollars of assessed value for a municipal charge of $800. Again, the farm assessment credit is applied, reducing the total municipal charge to $44. This property would owe $264 in property taxes. In the second column, the same property outside a municipality, the provincial property taxation charges are calculated in the same way, resulting in a charge of $220. Because the property is located outside of a municipality, there is no municipal taxation charge, but the fire dues are identified on the taxation bill, in this case $25, for a total charge of $245. In this example, there is a $19 per year difference inside or outside a municipality. It is very hard to generalize since the amount charged for fire dues varies and the tax rates in municipalities varies. This example of a 20 cent municipal tax rate is not unusual. Half of the municipalities have a tax rate less than 20 cents. One of the best practices being recommended to municipalities is the use of differential tax rates with different tax rates for different areas based on the level of services provided. For example, a base rate would cover services like recreation programs and trails, land use planning, libraries or community halls, emergency planning, and fire service. Higher rates may be set for the areas receiving more targeted services, like stormwater management, additional police protection, sidewalks, or street lighting. There are benefits to having larger and more sustainable municipalities. 
there are opportunities for community engagement and for residents to have a say about their concerns and priorities. Economies of scale allow services to be delivered in a more efficient way, and there are opportunities for cost savings if nearby communities decide to share resources. This is important in protecting broader public interests, such as health and safety, water quality, and protection of resource land or natural areas. A larger population means that there can be more people participating in municipal elections. There are more opportunities to recruit and retain skilled staff, leading to increased accountability and transparency. When there is professional capacity to undertake services such as land use planning, this can lead to better infrastructure planning and better outcomes for our environment. A stronger and more cohesive municipality can attract more business and local development, strengthening our rural towns and regions. Many communities are facing challenges such as population shifts, infrastructure demands, environmental concerns, and climate change impacts. There are opportunities for communities to work together to create stronger municipalities, to address these challenges, and to build capacity to respond. This is important for the long-term sustainability of the communities we live in today. We hear questions and concerns from people who live in rural areas outside municipalities. One primary concern is that property taxes will increase. A differential tax rate system based on services could encourage a fair approach. It is difficult, however, to assess how individual property tax bills will be affected by municipal restructuring because of the varying tax rates and varying property assessments across PEI. Some areas considering restructuring undertake a municipal growth management study to consider a range of service and taxation options and assess the effect of different taxation scenarios. Some people are concerned about a loss of history and community identity. Belonging to a municipality can actually provide opportunities to protect history and community identity through land use planning or cultural and heritage activities. The community names for the civic addressing system and 911 will not be changed. Municipal politicians are elected to represent the interests of the municipality as a whole. New municipalities may establish electoral wards with balanced population distribution or elect their councillors at large. Existing liabilities and debts of neighbouring municipalities can be a concern. Province has committed to support transition planning to address barriers to cooperation. Living in a municipality is not necessarily more restrictive than living in an unincorporated area. Municipalities do have the authority to establish bylaws to meet the needs of residents and resolve issues. Whether you live in a municipality or not, there are rules and regulations related to land use and development. The province is committed to developing a provincial land use policy that will set standards for land use and development island-wide. Municipal land use planning processes are currently more advanced than provincial processes. Residents in municipalities with official plans have better opportunities for input and more certainty about development. There are three forms of municipal restructuring outlined in the Municipalities Act. Incorporation means the creation of a new municipality. Amalgamation is the process of joining together two or more municipalities with the agreement of each council. Annexation is the expansion of municipal boundaries to unincorporated areas. Municipal restructuring processes will not happen by surprise. The Municipalities Act defines process requirements. There must be public notice before a council can consider a resolution to annex, and councils must agree to amalgamation. An application package must be submitted, and there is public review with Cabinet making the final decision on the application. In November 2015, Minister Mitchell announced in the Legislature that proposals for new municipalities should meet basic requirements so they can be viable for the long term. 
new municipality should have at least 4,000 people and $200 million in assessed property value. Municipalities should have an office that's accessible to the public. There should be a service center and established infrastructure, economic, and institutional activity in the area. The municipality should be proposing to offer a range of local services to residents, and municipal boundaries must not purposely leave out existing municipalities. We encourage people to think broadly about their community of interest, where children go to school or where they play sports, for example. Any area that is considering restructuring options is encouraged to cooperate with neighboring areas to meet the basic requirements. One example in Eastern PEI is in the Three Rivers area. Seven municipalities have come together to talk about the possibilities across three fire districts, which includes unincorporated areas, for a population over 7,000 people. A preliminary report has been posted on the Town of Montague website and people are continuing to discuss options and possibilities. Adding up the total budget currently spent for administration in the seven municipalities provides an amount larger than the Town of Cornwall budgets for administration. You start to say, what would this allow for if we had a more cooperative approach to service delivery? Across the province, we are seeing the same trends. People are becoming more and more concerned about water quality. The cost of providing services in rural areas is increasing. The area of developed land is increasing, and this is usually at the expense of agricultural land. Because of our development patterns, we're seeing increasing conflict over incompatible land uses. Our rural areas are facing depopulation and our population in general is aging. We can watch these trends continue, or we can move toward building the resilience and the capacity that is required to address and reverse these trends. This map shows the residential building permits that were issued between 2002 and 2013 in areas where the province is the planning authority. The areas in gray are the municipalities with their own official plans and bylaws. It's easy to see the strip development along rural roads and at the shore. The same information has been converted to a heat map to show where the development pressure is the greatest. Housing development has leapfrogged outside of municipalities to areas with limited land use planning. We're building houses in our best farmland and our most scenic areas. This development pressure is greatest between Summerside and Charlottetown. There is far less pressure for development in the east and west, but the coastal activity is clear. There are not many ways right now to restrict urban-style development from encroaching into our productive resource areas. When urban-style development occurs near our working resource lands, there are often complaints about land use practices and nuisance. The Thompson Report recommended that a task force be established to lead public consultations on provincial land use policies. In August 2012, the members of the Task Force on Land Use Policy were selected after a public call for nominations. John Handrahan chaired the task force, and members included Janice Harper, Carol Horn, Paul Gallant, and Marvin Webster. Consultations were held in 2013, and the task force presented their report to government in 2014. The task force recommended statements of provincial interest, the adoption of a provincial land use policy, and a land use planning framework to implement the policies. The Planning Act provides the legislative authority for land use planning by municipalities and the provincial government. Currently, the province is the planning authority for 90% of the land in PEI, where subdivision and development regulations and some other legislation guide development decisions. In the remaining 10% of the province, 32 municipalities have planning responsibility. The municipal planning framework is often better developed than the provincial framework. These municipalities have official plans, maps, and bylaws which provide a detailed approach to the management of land and resources. 
The task force recommended that the provincial government improve its land use planning framework to ensure provincial interests are met, specifically protecting our land and water resources, protecting public health and safety, and ensuring sustainable communities. The provincial land use policy will be adopted soon and work is underway to prepare amendments to the Planning Act. The current land use map is based on the aerial photography taken in 2010. Currently, about 44% of the island has forest cover. 42% of our land is used in agriculture. About 7% is protected for environmental reasons and 7% is developed with houses and roads. In the future, a general land use map will be developed to implement the provincial land use policy. The map will identify and designate different land uses based primarily on current land uses. There will be more consultation on the provincial general land use map in the future. Our rural areas have an important influence on a community's viability and long-term survival. Having strong service centres ensures quality of life for rural residents and continued development of the rural economy. I don't see this as a conflict between urban or rural values. Our rural areas need strong service centres and our service centres depend on the economic drivers in our rural areas. Rural or urban, we all want access to many of the same services, like high-speed internet, cell phone coverage, emergency medical response, education, health service, retail service, post offices, childcare facilities, and recreational opportunities. It takes a critical mass of people to keep these services affordable. Many of the services we want for ourselves and our families depend on having a municipality to maintain and provide the infrastructure that's needed to offer the services. Larger municipalities will be able to respond more effectively and efficiently to the challenges we face. Commissioner Thompson, in the report of the Commission on Land and Local Governance, said, We cannot afford to maintain the status quo in a world that is changing all around us. The Department of Communities, Land and Environment is committed to working together with municipalities and all islanders to support strong, sustainable communities. Thank you for your interest in this important work. For more information, contact the Municipal Affairs and Provincial Planning Division by phoning 902-620-3558 or visit our website at www.gov.pe.ca slash mapp.